I'm Diane Ravitch. I'm research professor of education at New York University. As, as I know very well as a historian, the arts have always been under pressure uh, because they, they're, they're not at the top of most people's agenda, oddly enough, uh, because if you raise the question with parents about whether the art should be cut, there's usually an enormous outra uh, outpouring of, of outrage. People don't want the arts to be eliminated. Uh, but the, under today's high-stakes testing environment, uh, uh, an environment created, first of all, by No Child Left Behind, and now amplified by the race to the top, the arts really don't count. The arts don't matter. They're unimportant. So when a school has to make a decision uh, about whether to spend money on test prep materials, uh, or to let go an arts teacher. Very often the arts teacher has to be sacrificed to make more time and more resources available for testing because uh, the school's sur very survival uh, is now tied to the test scores. And the test scores don't reflect uh, whether kids were engaging in the arts. They simply reflect how much time they spent learning basic skills and learning how to take tests. So it's, this is really today, uh, in my view, a very toxic environment for the arts. Uh, because there is a lot of official pressure uh, that excludes them and, and diminishes their importance. I think the arts are terribly important for all children and I think that uh, what is particularly tragic today is that in, in schools that are attended mostly by kids who are poor and mostly by children who are African American or Latino, uh, that the arts are, are minimized because the pressure on these schools is inordinate to raise test scores. Uh, so these will be the schools that might be most at risk for not having the arts. So arts educators could well argue uh, that the, the students need the arts, first of all, to motivate them to come to school, uh, but also to have some joy in their school day, uh, some opportunities to do things that, that don't diminish them and don't uh, label them and rank them and rate them, uh, but rather give them an opportunity for expression. Uh, but I'm very leery of the argument uh, that the arts have a utilitarian function, uh, such as to raise test scores. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be empirically true, uh, but more importantly, I think it, it, in, in some peculiar sense, you buy into the assumptions of the people who want to test everything all the time. If you say the function of the arts is to raise test scores, that's not the function of the arts. And, and you, I think it's a mistake to uh, take what's most important about the arts and to, and to subjugate it to the purposes of, the, um, of, of those who are test crazed and, and crazed, uh, obsessed with data. Uh, you, you can't let their assumptions uh, govern uh, the rationale for the arts, which is first and most importantly about expressing and developing one's humanity. What's happening today in, in our schools is that uh, because of the testing regime, um, there is a tremendous um, demand for conformity. There's a tremendous demand for compliance and obedience. And uh, the most successful student in, in the current regime will be the one who gets the right answer. <clears throat> what we should be seeking, on the other hand, is the student who asks questions and the student who looks at the questions that have been posed and, and can say, this isn't even the right question. I can't answer this question because it's not the right question. Uh, the answers are wrong and the question's wrong. So through the arts, it's possible to encourage, uh, in fact, to prioritize divergent thinking. And many educators will talk about the value of critical thinking, but there's a very different kind of thinking that I think is important, and that's divergent thinking, to think differently. Uh, to see things that other people don't see. That's, to me, is the most crucial element uh, that's needed for the future. And that can be certainly a great strength and is a great strength of arts education, is, is that students are not asked to uh, fill in a blank. Uh, they're not given a preset question with preset answers. Uh, rather, they're invited to create. And the experience of creativity, you can't be creative unless you have the opportunity to be creative. And so I, I think that in, in this sense, the arts may be the one place in the curriculum uh, where divergent thinking is encouraged and prioritized. And this kind of thinking, divergent thinking, may be in fact what is most needed in the next, in this century. Uh, and, and it is being sacrificed every day in the testing regime.
Under the current circumstances of uh, first No Child Left Behind, and now it's race to the top, and with more and more states adopting um, legislation saying that teachers will be judged by their students' test scores, it will be harder and harder for uh, classrooms to prioritize divergent thinking because if the children, if the students think too differently, they will fail the test. Many, I've seen many, many tests. I, I spent seven years on the National Assessment Governing Board overseeing the NAEP testing, the National Federal Testing Program. And uh, we reviewed all the questions and uh, more, more times than I would like to recall, we had to say this is not a good question. Uh, this should go back. Uh, I think that people assume that standardized tests are somehow a scientific instrument. They're not. Uh, they are errors in the scoring, they are errors in the writing. And to me, the, the very, in, in this case, the medium of a standardized test question is itself a, almost a kind of oppression. It's an oppression of, of thinking. It's forcing thinking into a narrow channel. And uh, the best kind of student thinking would be the student that picks the question apart and says why it could be asked in a different way and why it's the wrong question and why it diverts us from what matters most. Uh, but that's not what we're asking students to do. We're just asking them to obey and conform. So I think the argument for the arts has to be um, against the grain. And it's very tough to do in this environment because against the grain today uh, means that you are taking on both political parties, the federal government, most of the state governments, and a mindset that has completely enveloped uh, educational thinking uh, that, that is actually very narrow and very utilitarian and anti-aesthetic and, and anti-intellectual as well. So that's asking a lot of arts educators. But I think that I believe in arts educators because it's in their nature to, to be different. Uh, and it's in their nature to encourage different thinking. So I think that uh, even under the oppressive conditions that exist today in education, arts ed educators if will see in it the opportunity to be the rebels that are most appreciated in the arts world. Uh, the arts world doesn't like uh, people who just check off boxes and get rewards for being obedient conformist. It likes rebels. When I, when I talk about improving education, I, I always talk about what, what a complete education consists of. And I always begin with, um, in addition to the basics, which we're now emphasizing endlessly and testing endlessly, a complete education begins with the arts. And it also includes history and civics and geography and the sciences and foreign languages and physical education. Those are the basics um, to me. But I always begin with the arts because to me, the arts are such a, an elemental form of human expression uh, that it's hard to imagine having a, a, a qu high quality of life without the ability to engage in music and dance and uh, to, uh, to do art, to appreciate art and to do art, both of those things. I think the arts today have so many different forms that it's almost impossible to list them because many uh, people, uh, particularly young people, are, are adept at creating art in, in digital forms, which I wouldn't know how to do, but I can enjoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that when you see the response that people of all ages have, and, and in all cultures for that matter, to a visual art, uh, to, uh, to dance and to song, you realize that it's, it's fundamental to us as human beings that we have to engage in expression and also um, uh, participate in, in viewing other people's expressions. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is that uh, when you do art all by yourself and no one ever sees it, it doesn't really become art until you share it with others. Uh, this is something that, that I've learned about writing, that if you write just for yourself and you never show it, you write something and then you kill it on your computer, it's not really writing. Uh, writing is what you write f to be read and not just by yourself. And in the same sense, art, whether it's song or dance, is created to be shared. Well, I think that what makes art powerful, particularly, um, well, for people of all ages, but particularly for children, is the capacity to express one's feelings. Um, and and that, that might range from 
uh, joy uh, to all sorts of negative feelings, but just the ability to have a format in which to express them and not to bury, bottle them up inside you. And I think art creates the opportunity for uh, a very uh, personal expression of, of uh, joy, rage, uh, all sorts of things in between. The arts are not a silver bullet in relationship to test scores. The arts are a fundamental aspect of being human. So the argument has to be made for the arts that to deny them to children uh, is wrong uh, because it cuts them away from one of the most important forms of human expression and spiritual expression. Uh, and that to the extent that arts classes and arts teachers are uh, removed, uh, it will be to the particularly disadvantaging to the children who already have the least. So that it might be almost a form of, of, of class and race discrimination. Uh, if you look around and you see that the, where the layoffs are occurring and where the arts are being, uh, time is being reduced or eliminated for the arts, it will invariably be in the poorest communities. Uh, so I think the, the basic argument for the arts has to be made in terms of what the arts uniquely contribute. And, um, and so I would argue don't buy into the, uh, the testing world's uh, arguments, but rather insist on what is uniquely valuable to the arts, and that is the, the power of, of, of development, of personal development, of human development, of spiritual development, of creativity development, all of these issues being, these being uh, uh, the qualities that the arts address uh, that are not addressed by other parts of the curriculum. There is something in the nature of schooling today, at least in most schools, that's very abstracted from reality. Uh, when children learn about history, they don't feel that they're part of history. They're learning about something that happened very far away, and they read about it in a textbook, and it seems very unreal to them. Uh, the same thing with almost everything that they study. There's, there are many different levels of abstraction uh, that separates them from what happened, or what is happening, or what might happen, to what they're learning. I think that one of the uh, unique functions of the arts is that it's immediate, it's real. The participation in the arts is something that it involves you and what you do and what you see, what you hear, what you uh, make with your hands or what you create out of, of the interesting channels in your own brain. Uh, this is real. So I think that is a, a, a way of filtering through all these levels of abstraction that separate children from real life. In a sense, it's uh, one of the reasons why du John Dewey uh, wrote about the arts, because the arts are experience. And most other school studies, studies uh, young people are learning about other people's experience. In the arts, it's their own experience that they are recreating for themselves and for other people. Well, I think that the uh, arts advocates have to make the case for the arts based on what the arts alone can do. Uh, and this is a very powerful argument. I think it resonates with the public. And I think that in any situation, in any city, in any school district where the arts are threatened, uh, that arts educators have to go right to parents, right to the public, right to the civic leaders, right to the business leaders. I mean, there is an, arg there is an economic argument to be made for the arts. They are a powerful generator of, uh, of economic activity cultural activity in every community in this country. And many people move to cities or to communities specifically because of the cultural advantages. Uh, but I think that the, the, the basic argument is about the development of children, the development of young people, the opportunity to become a, a, a full and complete human being. And no one wants their child denied those opportunities. So I think that the, what's crucial is uh, in this time where we have our leaders on, on both sides of the aisles, Republicans and Democrats, obsessed with testing, obsessed with data, obsessed with the very things that crush the spirit of creativity and, and originality uh, amongst young people, uh, it becomes all the more important that arts educators make their argument and say, uh, our case is not based on test scores. Our case is based on what's right for children, what's right for young people, and providing every young person the opportunity uh, that we would want for our own children. At, th at this moment in time in our history, uh, teachers are massively demoralized across the country. Uh, there has been for the past two or three years, and perhaps for the, most of the past decade, uh, an anti-teacher 
line of argument in the public media. Uh, and we see state after state pushing legislation that says uh, if test scores are low, it's the fault of the teachers. Uh, this isn't true. In, in fact, uh, the, the test scores are come about for many different reasons. Um, mostly they're correlated with family income. Uh, and so when you look at any testing program, any standardized testing program, you see the most affluent kids have the highest scores and the poorest kids have the lowest scores. And uh, the politicians want to tie this to the teachers. Uh, and I think that having spoken to many, many teachers over the past two years, I can say that the uh, degree of demoralization across the country is profound. I think that the, the easiest thing to do for te to support teachers is just to have a formal program of saying thank you, thank you for serving, to recognize that those who teach are in fact performing a public service. People don't go into teaching in the, uh, with the hope of making a, a large income. Uh, there, there are many other ways they could make more money than becoming a teacher. They understand that their lifetime income will be less than those of their classmates who choose other lines of work. This is public service, and I think that uh, what we should be doing uh, at every level of our society is expressing gratitude to teachers, uh, but not lip service. And I think the teachers are very quick to spot phony lip service, and they see it from politicians, they see it from high-level officials in the government who uh, issue their thanks on uh, Teacher Appreciation Day, but the rest of the year uh, blame teachers for things that are way beyond their control. So I'd say that uh, teachers need to feel that they're respected members of the community, uh, but more than that, they need to, we as a society have to stop blaming them uh, for social conditions that have been created by the outsourcing of jobs, uh, by the growing income gap in our society, by the growing levels of poverty. I mean, the, to me, the most outrageous fact of our society today is that more than 20% of our children live in poverty. And uh, we're always talking about we want to be number one. Well, we're number one in child poverty amongst the uh, highly developed nations of the world. And this should be a scandal that's talked about all the time. Uh, so the arts can't heal that gap, but the, the, certainly the arts can bring comfort, spiritual expression, um, support to children, to young adults. Uh, and the people who do this are uh, doing, I think, the most important work of our society. And we need to thank them every day, but also support them in the work that they do and stop this uh, national media obsession with blaming teachers for problems created by politicians and by um, uh, corporations and by others who are heedless of the well-being of our society. Well, families are crucial, and, and they're crucial for uh, some obvious reasons. Uh, before children arrive in school, they have been either exposed to a lot of very vocabulary or a little vocabulary, and that makes a big difference. Uh, whether children have uh, you know, basic food needs met, health needs met, that's all up to their family. It's not, first of all, up to their school. So the family is crucial in terms of setting the stage for children even being open to education and willing to uh, engage uh, usefully in the classroom. I think that arts educators have uh, some very unusual opportunities to partner with families because there's so much that arts educators do that families absolutely love. You know, when children are engaged in a play, uh, when they're engaged in a musical performance, uh, the families love to come and see their children perform. So this is an opportunity to draw families in in a way that many other teachers don't have. Uh, and it, it creates a powerful partnership when the parents see their children on stage or see that they have created something in the classroom and they bring home their work. And um, th there's a much more, I think, uh, open flow of communication between arts educators and families uh, through the children and through the work of the children uh, where arts educators can be uh, very actively engaged with families. Well, I'd say that my first exposure to the arts was in school. Um, and um, I, I'm going to say in my talk today that uh, one of the things I regret in life is that when my mother tried to make me take piano lessons, I didn't listen to her. I should have. I cut piano lessons went to play baseball. Um, but in school, we, we were taken to the orchestra. This was in Houston, which is pretty unusual. Uh, and we were exposed to museums, and it just seemed to be a, a natural part of school life. Uh, as an adult, I've always loved the arts. I go to museums. I love, love Broadway plays. Uh, and it's just uh, such an important part of my own life. And it, 
it seems criminal somehow not to make that part of, of young children's lives in school. But I think that there are many ways to engage in the arts, some of them quite personal, and others at, 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 at a remove. I mean, seeing a play in a way is at a remove, but I'm always just incredibly impressed uh, by the people who, who perform and can transform themselves into another personality and make you believe in a totally new reality uh, where you uh, do something that in the theater would be called a willing suspension of disbelief. You really can believe that people can fly or you really can believe that you're in a different century or in a different world. And that's, that's a magical experience. I did try as an adult to start piano lessons, but I found myself so impatient that I, didn't, I couldn't discipline myself. I can only discipline myself to do one thing, and that's to write. I have iron concentration when it comes to writing. I can will out the rest of the world. And I like to think that, my, that by writing, I'm doing something that's also, in, in its own way, it's creative. Writing involves taking words out of the air and turning them into sentences that somebody else can understand. So I think that's creative, but that seems to be the only creative thing that I can do. I've failed at painting, I've failed at dancing. I, when I watch people do line dancing, I just stand there in awe and I think, how do they know which way to go? I mean, if I joined a line dance crew, I'd be falling down on my face every other minute. I wouldn't know which way to go. Everybody would go to the right, I'd go to the left. Uh, but the one thing I can do is I have this uh, iron concentration for my work of writing. Um, and uh, uh, I may yet learn to play the piano. I w I'm not giving up hope yet. <laughs>